Hi, Democrats, and happy 2024. We are back. We are back. Um, so we're going to redo some things this year. It may not be a daily. We're going to we're going to kind of test the waters and see how often you guys want us to be here. But we are going to be here every Thursday because when legislative session starts, we're going to we are fortunate this year that we're going to have a representative who's going to come on every week and tell us what they talked about through the week. And speaking of that representative, I'm just going to cut to the chase and introduce um, Representative Mickey Dollins right now. Hey, Alicia. Happy New Year. Hey. Happy New Year to you. How's it going? Oh, we're off to an exciting start. My son, Dean, lost his first tooth last night. So he got a little visit from the tooth fairy this morning. And it was very easy, too. I uh, got a little paper towel and I did the classic one, two pool, expecting it on three and it popped right out. And uh, everyone was really excited, very proud. And I can't believe it. He's only five years old and he just lost his first tooth. My daughter, who's four, was a little jealous. She was wanting to lose some teeth as well so she could get a visit from the tooth fairy. But uh, yeah, exciting times around here to kick off 2024. So is the tooth fairy a little broke now? You know, that <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, a little bit less rich. That's uh, fair to say. <laughs> So as I was as I was saying, I've been doing my this Facebook live basically every day since um, early March, late February, early March of 2020. It came about as a result of COVID. I wanted to keep in touch with Democrats and make sure that they knew kind of they knew what I knew about things that were going on in the state capitol. And this year, we're going to test it. Maybe because I'm moving about the cabin and it's an election year, maybe we don't need to do it every day. But um you are still willing to do it every week, right? Um, yeah, definitely looking forward to that. And there's going to be plenty to talk about at the end of each week and uh, what, what has happened in the legislature. Right. And the our state legislature, the majority in our state legislature have made sort of like a pledge or a declaration of the kinds of legislation that they are going to put forth in this legislative session. I can't remember what the title was. Have you heard the mantra well the you know the bottom line is all of our bills that we introduce uh help oklahomans in some way or another instead of taking away from public schools and giving them to uh, wealthy individuals as private school coupons we want to invest in our schools we want to make sure that people who are working 40 hours a week can afford rent and can eventually save up to buy uh, for a down payment on a home so everything that my colleagues and i do in the house and also my Democratic colleagues in the Senate is very people focused, people, people based. You know, if you unless you're one of those wealthy, affluent individuals or corporations who can afford to have a lobbyist at the Capitol, um, it's tough to get your, you know, it's tough to have your voice heard. And we believe that it's our duty as elected representatives to be that platform, to be that voice for the everyday Oklahoma who doesn't have the finances to afford their personal lobbyists. And so at the, at the heart of everything we file, that's exactly what we hope to accomplish. So when I got involved in the party seven or eight years ago, I, it was the first I learned that representatives such as yourself, you get eight bills, right? Is it eight? Correct. In the House, we can uh, introduce up to eight bills. And in the Senate, they can author an, unlim an unlimited amount. But we have to be uh, a bit specific on which bills that we put forth uh, to hopefully receive a committee hearing. Now, just because you author eight bills in no way means that you're going to be guaranteed even a committee hearing, which is the first step in the legislative process. And so what is the genesis of the bills that you submit, for example, like when you sit down and you say, I'm going to come up with some bills, where do you get your ideas? Uh, at this point, going into my eighth year in the legislature, all of my bills originate from constituent ideas. For example, in South Oklahoma City, we have a lot of tenant protection issues when it comes to uh, not only affordability, but tenants being um, given the rights that they deserve. Um, we don't want out of state corporate landlords ignoring basic improvements. And because of that, a couple years ago, I authored and co-authored a bill that would allow tenants to make repairs up to the amount of one month's rent and not have to pay that amount on the next month's rent. So little things like that, anti-retaliation laws, going to the news and speaking out on inhabitable conditions uh, is no reason to be evicted from your apartment. 
Now, we did make progress with that in the House. It got caught up in the Senate last year, but that is a bipartisan effort that Representative Daniel Pei and I are going to continue to work on to hopefully get that over the finish line here in 2024. So I wanted to talk about that because it's January, right? We're four days in and it's it's a multiple election year because I believe that all years are election years because we have elections every year. But this year is the year that most people are paying attention to, right? We have 101 state rep uh, seats that are up this year. We have 24 state Senate seats and we have five U.S. Congress seats that are up this year in addition to the president, right? Because those seats affect us more, more to me, more directly. The folks who live in my state affect us more, affect me more directly. What is, if you just had one word to say about this year, what would it be? That'd be focus. I mean, without question, 2024 is going to provide a lot of distractions, a lot of naysayers, a lot of people who try to take you off the course for your goals and ultimately, you've got to go back to focus. I think back on my experience on the USA bobsledding team, playing college football, and now in the legislature, you can bet that there's always going to be people trying to play mind games, trying to cheat. Sometimes like in a sport like bobsled or football, you're going to get injured. But at the end of the day, you have to go back to that word focus. Focus on what you can control. Focus on the end goal. Because every time someone detracts from that focus, then you're playing defense and you're not on the offense and offense is getting closer and closer to your goals. And so when we go into 2024, we're gonna have a lot of distractions. There's gonna be false allegations. You're gonna see deep fakes. There's gonna be a lot of manipulation in the media. And we as citizens of Oklahoma and as Americans have to be vigilant and do our due process, and not just jump to conclusions, but to see the whole picture. Otherwise, it's going to be utter chaos, which a lot of people have already started to know, notice that. So my, mo my main word, my focus going into 2024 is going to be exactly that, the word focus. So I, I like that idea of focus. And, and it's funny, I went back through my Facebook posts. I'm old enough that I still do Facebook. I went back through a lot of my Facebook posts and it feels like every 120 days or so, I just po post the word focus because like you said, it's so easy, you know, with all of the court cases that we're going to hear about. And like you said, all of the deep fakes, because we have all the AI now and all of the national politics that are going to somehow permeate our local races. It's important that we focus on the, the legislation that, you know, you and your colleagues are trying to put forward. Right. Get rid of the vexatious lawsuits and let's help some let's help some renters and let's let's help that's directly affect Oklahoma laws. And that's why I'm proud to be a Democrat. And that's why I'm proud of the of uh, you folks who represent us, because these are bills where I can point to a person in my life who's been directly affected by the topic. And I think that's what's important. Yeah, it's well said. Focus not only gets you closer to your goals, but it also preserves your own mental health. Focusing on what you can control and then being able to spend the rest of your energy on your family and friends is what's most important. They're so toxic out there. There's a lot of people who are going to try to run you down. There's going to be a lot of people who are spreading false information. And as voters, we also need to focus on turning out other people to vote, getting people registered, finding a candidate you like, volunteering on that campaign. Getting back to the basics is important and focus goes right back into that. So focus on what you can control, focus on your goals and focus on your own mental health. And so so as I as I prepared for today, I thought, Let's talk about what is important right today on January 4th. And to me, what's important here today on January 4th is that we are 40 days, 40 days from city council and school board elections. We don't need to be looking all the way to November right now. We need to focus on what is directly in front of us. There are city council, city council and school board races that will be on a ballot in 40 days, right? Then the next, the next goalpost. Um, presidential primary election, right? We will vote for our, pre our narrowing it down to our primary election on March 5th. That's 61 days, two months from now. We need to be really focused on, so it doesn't get past us, so we don't get distracted by all the things. We need to be focused on how what is affecting our lives. City council and school board, those are the people who live the closest to you. 
those are the races that that I want more people to focus on because we start here on the ballot and a lot of people never make it down to city council and school board. Mm -hmm. um, and those are the people who are at the same grocery store and so understand how what gas prices are. Um, and I think it's just important that we focus on those kind of things and we don't have time to waste. And so you summed it up very well. For me, on, on this side of the electoral process, for me, what's most important right now, registering folks to vote. Yeah. Having real conversations with people, not about the D and the R and the L, but really about what their values are. Right. Turn off MSCC, MSNBC, CNN, Fox, and let's talk about what is really important. And then who represents that by name and by policy, not by letter. Right. Registering folks to vote. And then picking specific candidates that you're going to help. Right. I bet you're out knocking doors and wouldn't it be helpful if some because it's cold outside. Wouldn't it be helpful if somebody would park at the end of the street and, and help you along? You can hop in the warm car and get you some coffee. That's right. right. And it's better. And it makes it a little bit less lonely. Exactly. Picking a candidate to help right now. Don't wait until the primaries. Don't wait until sometimes later. Our candidates need your support and encouragement now, not April. Now they're going to need it in April, but start now so that they continue to do the work because we need the continued. Um, we need the continued representation. Right. Very well said. And I would also add to that in that uh, the Oklahoma online voter portal will tell you that if your voter registration is up to date, maybe you've moved, maybe things have changed, maybe you want to change your party affiliation. You still have time to do that. Just go to OK Voter Portal, type in some basic information. Not only will it tell you where and where you are registered to vote, it'll tell you where you go to vote. It'll tell you who all of your elected officials are from the U.S. Senator down to the two U.S. senators, down to your uh, local city council member. So it's extremely important to stay engaged. Oklahoma actually has some pretty savvy tech tools out there to help people organize and to help people um, uh, know exactly the plan of action they need to take uh, as we get closer and closer to these elections, which you mentioned are just right around the corner. I'm glad you mentioned the state voter portal because that was the last thing that I was going to talk about. It's the beginning of the year. And in Oklahoma, every year, you have to request your absentee ballots. So now is the time to go out and request your absentee ballot, even if you plan on showing up on election day. Your absentee ballot can be sort of a cheat sheet, right? It can tell, it can warn you that an election is coming up and it can give you an opportunity to see what's all going to be on your ballot and give you an opportunity to do the research so that you show up to the ballot box educated, or you can just fill it out and mail it. But I, who are very aware of when all the elections are. I sign up for my absentee ballot every year because I never know where I'm gonna be for one, but also for the research, because I deal with candidates, but I don't always know all of the ballot measures and all that kind of stuff. And it gives me an opportunity to research. So that's the Oklahoma State Election Board voter portal. All you need to know is your name and your birthday, <laughs> and you can request your absentee ballot. And as Representative Dolan said, you can re-register as a Democrat. I'm going to put words in his mouth. But you can change your registration. You can update your address. As long as you stay in the same county, you can do all of that from the comfort of your phone. Exactly. So um, we can't end without talking about the governor of our, of our great state and his decision regarding the summer food program. I don't want to put you on the spot because I got plenty to say, but I'd Maybe. like to hear your perspective. Yeah, the governor said that it was too difficult to administer and implement the federal dollars to feed hungry kids, which there are 400,000 of them in Oklahoma. Yet it's not too difficult to administer and implement $7,500 in private school vouchers for wealthy families who are already sending their kids to private schools. That right there should tell you all you need to know about the two parties' priorities. Feed hungry kids at 40 bucks or $7,500 private school vouchers that take away from public schools. There's no question. It is ridiculous. Uh, it is a lame excuse. There's no reason why our federal dollars, our tax dollars that we give the federal government, shouldn't be coming back to Oklahoma to feed the 400,000 plus hungry kids 
across the state. And the governor said, oh, well, that's the nonprofit's jobs. Nonprofits can do that. Yeah, good luck. If you live in Oklahoma City and Tulsa, you may have a big nonprofit food distributor nearby. But you go out to Hominy, go out to Pahuska, go out to Antlers, you're going to be hard pressed to find a nonprofit that can help uh, supply hungry kids with food. It's a disgrace. Uh, it just tells you where the priorities are. And um, it, I'm extremely upset and uh, frustrated by the continued direction of putting people last and uh, just to score a few political points because your, per, your preferred uh, party isn't in uh, the executive office in D.C. It's disgraceful. So Joe Biden, President Joe Biden has said, and I don't think he said it originally, but I'm going to quote him. He, you know, he said, um, let me see a man's checkbook and I can tell you what he cares about. Right. And I, I've lived by that. What a person spends their money on tells you what they care about. And I think so, so does the government. If we look at our government government's budget, and I'm talking about state level here, we did not have a comprehensive thought out plan to deal with the tax credits or as, as we know that they are school vouchers, coupons for the financially well situated. Right. We did not have a plan. I mean, we literally less than a month ago today got the system up, even though school has been going on for a semester. But we went ahead and rolled with that because that benefited, you know, a certain group of people. The governor cited at least two reasons of why he didn't, um, why he declined to participate in the summer program. Right. One was he wasn't sure that we could handle the administration. All of a sudden, he cares about that. And then the second was that he was concerned that if we fed hungry kids, they might get the so Biden's social agenda. I am out here begging people to vote. I assure you that minors don't vote. And minors are not going to be looking at their peanut butter sandwiches and wondering, did this come from a Democrat or did it come from a Republican? Child hunger should not be politicized. Child hunger is not a Democrat or Republican issue, or it shouldn't be. But our governor chose to make it a political issue, and he chose to interject partisan politics in feeding kids. And so he chose not to participate in feeding hungry children. We're number six. We're number six in child hunger. It's not even like we're, like we're doing well. We're number six in child hunger, and our governor chose not to participate, and I'm trying really hard to use the right words, chose not to participate in a program because he was afraid, or he was concerned, I don't want to say afraid, he was concerned that it might come with liberal social agenda. I, I am fortunate to have not been a hungry child. I've known hungry children. They are not thinking about politics, and they can't vote. They just are thinking about their next meal. Yeah. Thankfully, on the Cherokee Nation and Chickasaw Nation reservations, those leaders considered, without the politics, considered their citizens and are making provisions to help. Right. And this is a situation kind of like what our governor is always talking about, where he has created a situation where folks on the reservation will be treated differently than folks off of the reservation. And in this case, children who attend schools, eligible children who attend schools on the Cherokee and Chickasaw nations, regardless of if they are tribal citizens or not, will be assisted through this program. Children outside of those reservations are going to have to depend on charity and hope that that charity is within reach of their family. Yeah. This is going to negatively affect rural Oklahoma. It said where there's a will, there's a way. When I was a teacher at U.S. Grant High School, we sent kids home with backpacks full of non-perishable foods. We had a food pantry. We even had a washer and dryer. And uh, right after I got elected and, and left Grant, which is right down the street from my house, they implemented a student daycare in the back portable for kids 
who had small children and who and the whose students still wanted to graduate high school. Now, was that easy? Absolutely not. But we had leadership like Principal Greg Frederick, administrators, teachers who stepped up to help make that happen. And you know what? Instead of those kids leaving, dropping out, they graduated. Now, the, where there's a will, there's a way. There, no way was that easy, but we got it done. And so for Governor Stitt to use that as an excuse is, uh, is disrespectful and ignorant to all of the school administrators who are trying so hard each and every day, week after week, year after year, to make sure that their students don't go home hungry. But they can't do it all on their own. On their own. Nonprofits can't do it all on their own. That's the role of government is to ensure the safety and well-being of the people of Oklahoma and to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to reach their fullest potential. And I tell you right now, kids can't do that when they're hungry. Kids but are going, you to, know, up. As kids a former are going to get in trouble when they're hungry. And Let this me, is just so short-sighted and ignorant. And being the father of two small children, it's extremely upsetting. So I, I want you as a legislator, legislator to answer this question because I'm being attacked all over. It's amazing the amount of people who are for child hunger. It's it's amazing to me. But could you, as a legislator, just briefly, you don't have to go into all the details, when when we call it federal tax dollars that we're sending to, to a DC and it's coming back to us, could you give us like a high level explanation of where the money for this program comes from? Well, each year, of course, we pay into our federal taxes and in return, we get uh, support and help, whether that's in infrastructure, health care, food insecurity. And for so many years, uh, the stubbornness of the Republican legislature neglected to bring home our federal dollars to expand Medicaid expansion. For every one dollar we invest, the federal government gives us back nine. And for year after year, just because it was called Obamacare, they refused to help Oklahomans who were low income get on health care. And the people of Oklahoma had to use the power of the ballot initiative to go about and collect about 172,000 signatures within 90 days and then get it on the ballot and it passed. And as a result, now 250,000 Oklahomans now have health insurance who otherwise wouldn't. And that's thanks to the people of Oklahoma and the grassroots ballot initiative. Now that's a perfect example of how our dollars could come home, but we have a legislature who is so stubborn and who is so divisive that they would rather refuse our dollars that we put that we pitch in each year in order to make a political statement. It's terrible. Okay, I just wanted you to say that this is money that we we pay in. It's money that we pay in, and it would be coming back to help our citizens, our most vulnerable citizens, I might add. But it'd be back to help our citizens, and so the folks who are looking for a reason to not feed children baffle me, but I just wanted just to kind of high level explain that no one's coming to pick your pocket to pay, you know, little hungry Johnny, right? This is money that we pay in. Right. And they can definitely figure it out to say it's too difficult to administer and implement is pretty rich coming from a government that uh, forced private school voucher coupons for the wealthiest and even had a debacle in the implementation, but figured it out within a week. And it's already maxed out at 150 million. And now their priority going in is to increase that by another 100 million. So next year, the coupon can be worth $250 million. That's 100 million less that we have in going to our public schools. It's not funny, it's, it's really dangerous. And this is where it all comes tied back into focus. Do not get distracted by the ridiculousness. We have the right talking points. We know that what we're doing is going to help the those who can least afford it. We know that not everyone has straps on their boots to pull them up. And that's what we're trying to do is give everyone an opportunity to level the playing field. So everyone has the opportunity to reach their fullest potential. And that begins with education and basic things like ending food insecurity. Absolutely. Thank you so very much. I want to end on that because that was so great. I want to end on that. Um, hopefully we'll see you next Thursday. For those who joined us for the first uh, live of the year, thank you so very much. And you guys have a wonderful evening. Thank you.